of Islam in America, they will inshallah see the second part which is titled Struggling to Surrender. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey is professor of math at the University of Kansas. He uh, did, uh, he wrote some books in mathematics, many papers. He's a tenure professor, so he's famous in the world of math. Uh, and the uh, world of Islam, alhamdulillah, he finished his first book, which was titled Struggling to Surrender, which is the title of this lecture. And it will be published by, it is in fact published by Amana Trust Publications, and I think it's ready to go, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway, it will be in the market soon. And uh, it's going to be very effective in terms of da'wah among the non-Muslims. Explains his story and how he, what he found good in Islam and the rest of his story. Uh, though he's not going to mention this in this title, we just picked up the title because it does represent to us uh, most of what's going to be told in, in this uh, lecture, inshallah. Uh, he is going to talk first about the conversion itself and the suffering that people have, the decision-making process, how they make the decision, the hesitation they have, and then finally overcoming all the hesitation of becoming a Muslim and overcoming this difficulty and becoming a Muslim. And once they become a Muslim, the pain of becoming a Muslim or struggling to survive as a Muslim in a Muslim community and the difficulties he would have in adapting himself or herself as a new Muslim in the new world. So it is a life between two worlds, the world before and the world after. Uh, his second book was titled, as he mentioned it this morning, Even the Angels Asked, and this is, inshallah, his second talk. So would you kindly come and make the presentation, please? Okay, that's a good idea, yeah, because I don't need that. Okay. Lots of stuff up here. I need a minute to get organized. Sounds like one of my children. <laughs> uh, Salaamu Alaikum, peace be unto you. <clears throat> In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. <clears throat> the books that Hamid Ghazali was talking about, I didn't really write them for the purpose of introducing non Muslims to Islam. I wrote them for my children originally, so that someday when they grow up and they face the conflicts that I expect them to face as young American Muslim children, the dilemmas, the questions, etc., that in some sense my experience, I hope, will help them. And I wrote it really primarily for that purpose, and I originally didn't intend to publish them at all. I just bound them myself and put them in our home library and I hoped that someday they would be interested enough to look at them. But then later uh, it fell into the hands of a publisher and now they're going to be published. <coughs> what I do, Brother Hamid asked me to talk about trials and tribulations that Muslim converts go through. I told him, uh, Bro uh, Hamid, I'm not really excited about this topic. First of all, there are a lot of Muslims around the world that are suffering a lot more than any convert does in the United States of America. And I think their trials and tribulations are much more significant. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I said, this is not the most inspiring lecture in the world. 
Because if I deliver it truly and accurately, I have to talk about the upside and the downside, the successes and the mistakes. And most of audiences love to hear about the heroics, but we don't really enjoy hearing about some of the, dark, some of the weaker realities. So I'm warning you in advance, this will probably be the least popular lecture I ever give. And I'm also not sure what benefit this lecture is to anyone. But rather than implicate other non-Muslim, I mean other Muslim converts, I'm going to try to restrict my sort of criticism to uh, myself. I do mention a few other Muslim converts that were very close to me at times, but I've changed their names just to protect the innocent, as they say. So uh, let me begin. The lecture begins on a very positive note. And it's the part of the, the beginning part Muslim audiences seem to love very much. Uh, the end part sort of ends on a an anticlimactic way. It ends, I think, in a very realistic way. It sort of ends open-ended. Because when you convert to Islam, you'll find that that first few days after conversion, or the first few weeks or months, are perhaps some, one of the most exhilarating and amazing times in your life. But when your feet eventually touch ground again, and they do, you find out that becoming a Muslim is more than just making the shahada. It's a lifelong commitment and struggle. It's a day-by-day -day continuous effort to surrender yourself to God. It's not just a joining of a religion, it's a continuous action. Which, of course, the word Islam means. It means a surrender. It's a verbal noun. And, and so the lecture, I think, has to end sort of in the middle of things. Because I'm not dead yet. <laughs> but in any case, so let me begin. This is highly personal information. At times, I'm going to talk about a few aspects of Islamic law. It's not because I want to argue a case. It's not because I'm trying to present a fatwa here today. I only and I'm not going to argue a case. I am only presenting it to let you know what sort of tensions, what sort of anxieties Muslim converts face. The tensions between sometimes what they think and what they feel they must do. So when I discuss them some things, it's not because I'm trying to argue a point. I just want to accurately present to you the way I felt about something at a particular time and then how I acted. So with all that introduction, let me begin. The first time I, uh, my first encounter with Islam may sound to you a little bit strange. It's really not so strange. Other people have, in other religions, even people who are not believers at all, have had similar type of experiences, but different. My first encounter was, in fact, in a tiny room with no furniture. And there was nothing on its grayish-white walls. The walls of the room were bare. Its only adornment, its only decoration, was the predominantly red and white pattern carpet that covered the floor. There was a small window, something like a basement window, facing above us, which filled the room with brilliant light. We were in rows. I was in the third row. We were only men. There were no women. We were all sitting on our heels in the direction of the window. It felt foreign. I didn't recognize anyone. I thought I may be even in a foreign country. We uniformly bowed down in prostration with our faces to the floor. It was serene and quiet, as if the sound had been turned off, like when you turn the sound off on the TV and you watch the picture. At once, we all sat back on our heels. As I looked ahead, I realized we were being led by someone in front of us, off to my left, in the middle, below the window. He was alone in his row. I only had the briefest glance at his back. He was wearing a long white gown and on his head was a white scarf with a red pattern or design. And that's when I awoke. It was a dream. I had this dream several times, beginning when I was around 16 years old. It was a rather remarkable dream because at that age I was moving very, very close to becoming an atheist and eventually became one when I was 17. 
But I would continue to have this dream every once in a while, say once a year or so, sometimes more frequently, sometimes less, for the next 10 or 12 years of my life. And it was always that brief and always the same. At first, it made absolutely no sense to me. But later, I came to believe, as I reached the ages of mid-20s or something, that it has, seems to have some sort of religious connection. And although I shared it with persons close to me, on at least one occasion, or maybe two, I remember telling my mother about it, it didn't be, appear to be worthy of bothering about or making a fuss about. It didn't trouble me at all. And as a matter of fact, I, when I awoke, I felt strangely comfortable. But in some sense, looking back now, I realize that perhaps, in some sense, that seems like my first encounter with Islam. Over the years, I was an atheist. I was an atheist from the time I was about 17 until I was 28. I wasn't a belligerent atheist. I didn't hate people of other religions. And I was a curious atheist. I was sincerely willing to listen to what somebody had to say their religious point of view. And I was sincerely curious. But generally when I talked to people I found that they confirmed my point of view, that religion simply doesn't make sense. Over the years I met many Muslims. I had many Muslim friends. And frankly I have to admit while they were some of the friendliest and kindest, kind, kind, most kind and most hospitable people I ever met, and I loved being around them, I found that when they talked to religion they to me, they made the less sense, least sense of anybody I spoke to. I have found that when I talk to, for example, Hindus or Buddhists or uh, people from uh, uh, somebody who know, knew something about Taoism or what I read about those religions, I found that people from other religions did a much better job of relating their beliefs to me than my Muslim friends. And so I very quickly dismissed Islam. But I continued to have these friendships. Well, strangely, one, of the, one day I walked in my office at the University of San Francisco. I was a new assistant professor there. And apparently, some student or some Muslim left a copy of the Quran on my desk. I had the habit of leaving my door unlocked. And I walked in my office one day and found it there. Later, I found out who it came from. But in any case, I kept it for a while, and out of curiosity one night, I picked it up, and I began to read the Qur'an. And you can't simply read the Qur'an. You don't just pick it up and read it like you read a novel. Not if you take it seriously. You've either already surrendered to it, or you fight it and combat it. The Qur'an attacks you, and it attacks tenaciously directly, personally. The Quran debates, criticizes, shames, and it challenges. From the outset, its very beginning, it draws the line of battle. And I knew that I was on the other side. And I also felt somehow that I was at a severe disadvantage. For it became clear to me that the author somehow appeared to know me better than I knew him. Painters can make the eyes of a portrait appear to be following you from one place to another. But what author, I thought, can write a scripture that seems to anticipate your daily changes, the shifts and changes in your thought? The Quran was always away ahead of my thinking. It was erasing barriers that I had built years ago and was addressing my questions and my doubts. Each night I would formulate key questions and objections as I read along with it, following along in this sort of dynamic relationship, this dialogue I was having with the Quran, only to discover the answer the next day or two days later as I continued on in the accepted order. As if the author was reading my ideas and writing in the appropriate responses before I got to it the next day. It was a frightening experience, I must admit. I had met myself in the pages of that scripture, and I was afraid of what I saw. I was being led, and I knew it. But by whom? I wasn't sure. I felt like I was painting myself in a corner, which contained only one choice and one decision. I needed to talk to someone, but no one I knew. I couldn't talk to anybody that knew me, especially no Muslims, friends of mine. 
because I didn't want there to be any expectations. I knew if I went to a Muslim friend and told him I was really seriously affected by what I read, he might get his, might get his anticipation up. He might you know, get excited about my becoming a Muslim or something. So I didn't want to disappoint him, and I certainly didn't want to clue him in. I needed to talk to someone that didn't know me, so that there would be no expectations. Well, in any case, it was Saturday. I was in San Francisco in Golden Gate Park, heading back to my apartment in Diamond Heights, for those of you who know the Bay Area. On my daily walk, I used to take a seven-mile walk every day, and I still do, and then I came to a solution. I would go to the mosque, or where the Muslims pray, on Monday, I thought, at the University of San Francisco. I assumed no one would know me there, and I could go in and just ask a few questions. Well, it wasn't really a mosque. It was a room of prayer lent to the Muslim students by the Society of Jesus at the University of San Francisco. And it was in the basement of St. Ignatius Church. Let me just say a word about St. Ignatius Church. It's located at the peak of Golden Gate Boulevard in San Francisco. It's a source of great pride to the university. The university catalog includes several shots of it from different angles. Now, I've seen more majestic churches, but when the fog rolls in over St. Ignatius Church and descends over it, its steeples appear to be reaching into heaven. It's a beautiful church. This Wednesday afternoon was clear and breezy. Notice I say Wednesday. I promised myself I would go Monday or Tuesday Monday to talk to the Muslim students, but now here it was Wednesday, and I still hadn't gotten up the nerve to do it. It was a Wednesday afternoon, and it was clear and breezy, and I was standing outside Harney Science Center, where my office was, trying to get up the nerve to walk across the parking lot to go to St. Ignatius Church, and I just couldn't get myself to do it. Finally, somehow, I seized some resolve and started across the parking lot. I promised myself I was only going there to ask a few questions. I wasn't going to convert, and I definitely wasn't going to make any decisions. Just ask a few simple questions, get sort of an insider's point of view, and that's it. And that seemed to suffice. It gave me enough courage to walk on over there. Why I was nervous, I didn't know. I, re I rehearsed my introduction as I headed across the, the parking lot. I was trying to think of what I would say as I got inside. Then I saw the stairway down to the mosque. It was up ahead by the statue of St. Ignatius. An American student had pointed the mosque out to me once, a female student. She said, the rumor is they keep corpses down there. <laughs> it was only a joke, but I was thinking about that while I stood at the foot of the stairs. I arrived at the top of the stairs and eyed the door below. And the writing on the door was definitely Arabic. That much I knew from my reading of the Quran, I recognized the Arabic writing. I could feel my heart racing as I stood there, hesitating, allowing my anxiety to grow. I thought I'd better ask somebody in the church if this was the right spot. I went around to the side entrance. I was feeling quite nervous. It was very dark inside the church, and the stained glass was sending down bold pillars of beautiful red and white colors that I remembered from my childhood, more than 12 years ago. <laughs> to the left of the altar, I saw what had to be a janitor. As I darted over to him, I passed in front of the crucifix without genuflecting. You're supposed to kneel and you go to the past the crucifix if you're a Catholic, which I was when I was a child. And I almost went ahead and, <laughs> and did it. It's amazing how these lessons get ingrained in you. Can you tell me where the mosque is? I said to the janitor. I must have looked very unbalanced, for his expression on his face was a combination of surprise and sort of anger and indignation. I didn't even wait for an answer. I went outside and drew a couple of deep breaths, breathing deeply. What a relief it was to be out in the sun again. I needed to relax a few minutes. I don't know what was seizing me. I circled the church a few times to see if there was any other possible entrance to where the Muslims pray. Maybe I had found the wrong place. Also, it gave me time to catch my breath. There was another possible entrance, but the door was locked, so I ended up back where I began, in front of the stairs by the statue. My chest tightened and my heart was pounding midway to the door as I went down the steps. I quickly turned around and climbed back up the stairs. Wait a minute. I scolded myself. You go in and outdoors every day at this university. There are only students in there, for goodness sake. I took another deep breath and backed down the stairs. The midway point was worse this time. 
When I reached the bottom, I felt constricted and sick. My legs that carried me seven miles every day on a walk were weakening, or almost buckling. I reached for the doorknob. My hand was shaking. I was shaking. I was sweating. I ran for the top of the stairs. I froze there, like a child, with my back to the mosque. I didn't know what to do. I felt embarrassed. I was embarrassed and defeated. I considered returning to my office, forgetting the whole thing. Several seconds passed. I don't know why people do this, but I gazed up at the sky. It was vast, mysterious, and comforting. I had fought the urge to pray for over ten whole years, but now my resistance was spent, and I just gave it a shot. Oh God, if you want me to go down those stairs, please just give me the strength. I waited. I felt nothing. I felt absolutely nothing. I was hoping that the ground might shake. A bolt of lightning might surround me. At least goosebumps. I felt absolutely nothing. I didn't feel anything. I turned around. I made a 180 degree turn. Walked down the stairs. Put my hand on the doorknob and pushed open the door. Are you looking for something? I apparently interrupted these two gentlemen's conversation. They were standing directly ahead of me, near the left wall. They both were barefooted and considerably shorter than I. One was dressed in what appeared to be a traditional sort of Middle Eastern, Far Eastern costume, with a round white cap on his head. The other young man wore Western clothing, and I had completely forgotten my lines. Uh, I knew I had to say something, so I just started spotting out Arabic names. Is uh, Omar uh, Mahmoud here? <laughs> I was getting nervous again. What's their last name? Was the response. <laughs> and now I was trapped. The one with the cap looks suspicious. Uh, I, I can't really remember. <laughs> it didn't help. Finally, somebody, one of them volunteered. There's nobody else here, just us. I thought, this isn't going to work. I'm sorry, I must be in the wrong place. Thank you very much. I started to turn around. Do you want to know about Islam? The fellow in the cap asked. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> As if it just suddenly dawned on me. Yes, I would. That would be nice. I took a step in towards inward. Would you please take off your shoes? We pray here, he apologized. The traditional fellow was doing all the talking. The other decided to merely observe, judging from his expression, something that was, for him was extremely unusual. We sat on the ground in the left corner. They let me choose the place, so I, pos I positioned myself so I was facing the door with my back to the wall. There was a small washroom off to my right and a closet side room, and it said, for the ladies, to my left. Abdul Hanan, a student from Malaysia, was the young man with the white cap. Muhammad Yusuf, the other student, was from Palestine. I told them what I knew of Islam. I didn't have done considerable reading. <coughs> and they seemed to be pleasantly surprised. Although we talked for about 15 minutes, I asked some superficial questions. Nothing was as I expected. All my plans, how I expected to go, this was completely out of sync. Abdul Hanan began saying something about angels beating the souls of dead disbelievers and the tortures they are subjected to in the grave. I only pretended to listen. I only half listened. I said that I had to get back to my office. I didn't really, but that excuse always worked. And I thanked them for their time. I was about to stand up to leave when the doorknob turned. It was now late afternoon, and the sun was descending so that it was stationed somewhat behind the door. The, the lighting in the room was dim so that when the door opened, the entrance was engulfed in light. Standing there was this silhouette, this, all you could see is this black image of a man with all this light around him. He had a straggly beard, ankle-high thobe, sandals, turban, and a cane. To me, he reminded me of the pictures I saw when I was a kid of Moses coming out of Mount Sinai. <laughs> he was biblical looking and fascinating. I had to stay just to talk to this guy for a few minutes. He was so fascinating looking. He entered quietly and he didn't seem to notice us. He was whispering what must have been a supplication or something, with his head raised slightly and his eyes almost shut. 
His hands were near to his chest with his palms turned upward as if he was waiting for his share of something. When he finished, he asked Muhammad, the brother from Palestine, something in Arabic, and then unassumingly walked into the washroom. I assume the question must have had something to do with me. That's Brother Hassan. My two friends looked revived and optimistic. He's the Imam. He leads the prayers. I knew from my re reading that Muslims had no official clergy. Anyone could lead, Muhammad offered. Abdul Hanan, myself, anybody. A moment later, Hassan came into the room. His head was lowered meekly as he came over to us. He had a slight, sort of Gandhi-ish kind of frame. His complexion was very fair, and his eyes and face were simultaneously peaceful and desolate as if he had resigned himself to some great personal tragedy. The other stu two students made room for him, and he sat down next to me. He placed his hand on my knee. What's your name? He asked. He was the first to ask that. And unlike Abdul Hanan and Muhammad, he wanted to talk casually at first, apparently to reduce the tension. And I certainly appreciated that, because my nerves were shot. His voice was low-toned and strong, and had a certain special resonance that gave him sort of an aura of inspiration. His accent told me that he was from Arabia. He was somewhat shy and tried not to look straight into my eyes. Jeff Lang, I told him. Are you a student at USF, he asked. At that time, I looked much younger at my than my age. I was 28 at that time, but people often mistook me for an undergraduate. As a matter of fact, I was thrown out of a faculty meeting once because they thought I was an undergraduate. <laughs> No, I'm a pro professor in the math department, I told him. His eyes widened. He glanced at the others. I don't know if that many thought I was lying or, or just surprised. We spoke a few more minutes, then Ghassan politely ex asked me if I would excuse them while they prayed the afternoon prayer. It was the first time I saw Muslims pray together. I used to break to stretch my legs, which were now very stiff from sitting on the floor. We returned to our places when they were done. Ghassan resumed the conversation. So how did you become interested in Islam? I didn't really know quite what to say. I said, I've been reading about it. And that answer apparently sufficed. We continued on for a while, discussing mostly technical matters, little aspects of Islamic law. I don't know how we got into that. But we, were really, we really weren't communicating. I was running out of questions, and he was running out of comments. We were both disappointed. I could see it on his face, and I could feel it inside myself. And I thought of getting back to the math department. Do you have any other questions, he said rather desperately. I looked at him and said, no, not really. But then something did pop into my mind. I do have one question, I told him. I waited. I wasn't quite sure how to formulate it. It was sort of a gut question. Can you tell me what it feels like to be a Muslim, I told him. I mean, how do you see your relationship with God? What is your relationship with God? Now, I could already see that Hassan had fantastic charisma and intuition, indispensable qualities to a spiritual leader, and I would later discover that he had a huge following both in and out of the United States, he even had a following in Pakistan. <clears throat> he was acutely sensitive to your inner pain, but he would never let you ignore it. He would magnify it in front of you and force you to focus on it. And this is a tremendous power that few possess and that every great religious leader must have, but it carries terrific responsibilities and dangers. His eyes met mine, and he didn't answer immediately. Maybe he was surveying the source and the intent of my question. And then he lowered his head as if he was praying, summoning his spiritual energy. And then he slowly started to shake his head from left to right, like when you want to indicate a negative response. And then he began to speak. And the first word he said to me sounded more like a prayer or a call, a call, than part of an explanation. Allah, he exclaimed. And he, and he exhaled a deep breath. Is so great. And we are nothing compared to him, he said. In comparison to him, we are less than a single grain of sand. And as he spoke, his thumb an index finger, I have to, Hamid, this is 12 years ago. He's saying, don't look at your notes. And this is, I, gotta, I can't hardly remember the details. And as he spoke, his thumb and index finger tightly squeezed a non-existent speck of sand, which he lowered to the floor, and then revealed, released to reveal nothing. And it made his symbol all the more effective. 
And yet he said, Allah loves us more than a mother loves her baby child. Ghassan was fighting back his feelings. His eyes were nearly closed and his head was still lowered. From here until he finished, his words were like the possession of a spirit that was burning with fear, hope, and desire. Each remaining sentence would be a wave of emotion, rising and then receding, rising and receding. And nothing, he said, happens except by the will of Allah. When we breathe in, and he put his hand to his chest, it is by his will. And when we breathe out, it is by his will. When we lift our foot to take a step, it is by the will of Allah. And we would never be able to put that foot back on the ground except by his command. Even when a leaf falls from a tree and twists and turns on its journey to the ground, no segment of that journey takes place except by Allah's will. And when we pray and put our nose to the ground, we feel a joy, a rest, a peace that is outside this world and no words could ever describe. You just have to experience it to know. And Ghassan remained quiet for several seconds, letting his words sink in. And how much I wish that I could change places with that young man, if only for a few minutes, so that I could feel that desire, that passion, that anguish, yearning, yearning for his Lord. I wanted to know the serenity and the torment, the trust and the fear, rising from insignificance and aspiring for surrender. I wanted to be resuscitated from this death that was my life. So would you like to become a Muslim, he asked. His words cracked the air like thunder, exploded in my mind. Why did he have to say that? That's not why I came here. I could see myself trying to explain it to my family, to my colleagues, to my friends. I was working at a Christian university, for goodness sake. What about my job? Faces and voices crowded my mind. My ex-wife, old acquaintances, a couple of them even dead. Well, I stumbled over excuses. I felt panicked again. My lower back and the back of my neck were hot. My palms were wet. What business was it of his anyway? Why not just leave it alone? Let us both walk out of there. He wasn't going to lose anything. I did my best to conceal my anxiety and alarm. I suffocated all that turmoil, stepped on my emotions, and spoke calmly. No, not today anyway. I, I really just came to ask a few questions. How I hoped that that would end it. I wanted to get back to my office. What was I even doing here? My body was locked in tension, braced for the next attack. I knew I'd have to be firmer this time, because these type of people never give up. But a part of me was straining to hear him say it again. A part of me was groping, pleading, begging, praying. Don't leave me. Not after having come this far. Ghassan had been through this before, and he knew better than to give up so easily. He was a veteran. <laughs> he tried again softly. I think you believe in it. <laughs> Why don't you just give it a try? The voices and faces were gone. There was no need to get so upset. I didn't owe anybody anything. Not Ghassan, not my friends, not my parents, no one. This decision was exclusively mine, I thought. And then I remembered my mom and all those lessons you taught me about being quote-unquote German, or German-Americans, that they taught my four brothers and I. And every culture has the same lessons, and they identify them as distinctly their own. But they're true in any case. And the lesson was, do what your heart feels is right. Follow your feelings. Follow your feelings, you used to say. The first time I applied that philosophy when I switched from engineering into mathematics. But now this decision seemed infinitely harder. I looked at my three friends, and to their amazement and shock, I nodded up and down and said, yes, I'd like to become a Muslim. <clears throat> Two days later, I experienced my first Friday weekly congregational prayer. It was a beautiful, warm, picture-perfect San Francisco Indian summer day. We're in the second of the two cycles of prayer. Ghassan was reciting the Quran in its unique and distinctive style. Most Quran recitation, I'm sure you all know, is sort of slow, melodic, and controlled. But Ghassan used to just release it from the deepness and depths of his needs. He was like an abandoned child calling for his parents. He would pound out his pleas in a tense, rhythmic chant. We stood there shoulder to shoulder, foot to foot behind him. Allahu Akbar, he called. 
On hearing the command, we bowed with our hands on our knees, backs perpendicular to our legs. And I whispered the divine praise, Subhana Rabbi al Adim, glory to my Lord the Great. And I thought to myself, thank you for bringing me here. Sami Allah Huniman Hamida, God hears those who praise Him, He called. We all stood straight and responded, Rabbana walakul hamd, our Lord, and to you the praise. Now we were standing in rows in tight formation. We had been moving as a single body. I had prayed four of the prayers on Thursday in the mosque but never with so many people. There must have been 80 students packed into that tiny room. Young men from all over the world, representing maybe 20 countries, celebrating our unity and brotherhood. Allahu Akbar, Ghassan called again. God is great. Fluidly and gracefully, we lowered ourselves to the floor, first to our knees, then to all fours. Then we put our faces to the carpet. I recited quietly, Subhana Rabbi Alala, glory to my Lord the highest, repeating it several times and thinking to myself, please never let me turn away. Allahu Akbar, he recited again, called out again, God is greater. And we sat back on our heels. We were in rows following Hassan. I was in the third. Allahu Akbar, he called. We uniformly bowed down in prostration with our faces to the red and white carpet. It was serene and quiet, but as if the sound had been turned off. At once we sat back on our heels. I looked ahead and I could see Hassan, off to my left, in the middle, below the window, which was flooding the room with light. He was alone in his row. He was wearing a long white gown, and on his head was a white scarf with a red design. The dream, I screamed in inwardly. Exactly, my dream. I had forgotten it completely, and I was stunned and frightened. Am I dreaming, I thought. Will I awaken? I tried to focus on what was happening to see if I was sleeping. A rush of cold flew, th flowed through my body. I shuddered. My God, this is real, I thought. Then the coldness subsided, and it was succeeded by a sort of a gentle warmth radiating from within and tears welled in my eyes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace be upon you and the mercy of God. Hassan called over his right shoulder. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace be upon you and the mercy of God. He called over his left. The prayer had finished. And I sat on the carpet studying the grayish white walls, trying to make sense of what had just happened. And I don't want to make more out of it than it is. Dreams are very strange. Many people have premonitions. Not, and many of them are not Muslims. And there is yet so much that we don't know about dreams. But whatever is the mechanism behind them, through that one, I saw the pieces of my life, things that I did, people that I met, opportunities I had, choices that I made that at the time didn't make sense, leading to this prayer and culminating in that prostration. I perceived that in fact God was always near, manipulating and directing my life, creating the circumstances as he does for any buddy, and the opportunities to choose, yet always leaving those crucial choices to me and to us, as he always does. And I was awestruck by the realization of the divine intimacy and love that that reveals. Not because we deserve it, but because it's always there. We only have to turn to it. I, to this day, I can't say with certainty what is the meaning of that vision, but I couldn't help but see in it a sign, a favor, and a new chance. Well. That was how I entered the Muslim community. And if you asked me at that time, or a week, or a month, or even two months after that, what was the toughest, hardest decision, the di most difficult time in my life ever, I would have told you the day I became a Muslim. But in fact, in time I came to realize that in some sense that was not quite correct. You know, that once a companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in returning from a military expedition said, we return now, from the lesser jihad, lesser struggle, to the greater struggle. And his companions, I mean his troops, were confused. They expected a more difficult battle that they were certainly going to be asked to go out on. What greater struggle? And he responded, the struggle within yourself, the jihad and nafs. That's a lesson I learned the hard way in the days after I converted to Islam. The struggle to make the shahada was really turned out to be in the long run not the most difficult struggle. All my fears about my parents and my job and etc. I have faced some difficulties with the non-Muslim community but nothing that I expected. Never, I still got tenured, I still got promoted, I still got research awards. My friends did back off from me somewhat. When I went to the University of San Francisco I was like a star. 
I remember the president of the university, who was a priest, even though I was an atheist, <laughs> but I was once a Catholic. He put his arm around me and was hanging on to me all the time around the, when they introduced the faculty. Now he was extremely upset <laughs> that one of, one of his new faculty members had become a Muslim at a Catholic university and they're trying to teach Catholic doctrine to these children. They thought it might be a bad influence. My friends backed off from me to some extent. They were, I think they were genuinely thinking that I might have flipped out. Lots of people do when they go to San Francisco. <laughs> but uh, they also felt that I would probably get over it. But nonetheless, in time, there was always a certain distance between me and my friends, my former friends. They never really could quite understand my conversion, and they were always a little bit, at the very least, suspicious or nervous. I mean, at the very, uh, on the worse end. And at the lighter end, some of them just thought I was terribly eccentric. <laughs> I just did some really crazy things. But nonetheless, the struggle against the American community turned out to be rather easy. I'm, for, I know some brothers and sisters meet tremendous hardship, but mine turned out to be not so hard at all. Maybe because I was so American looking and acting, they assumed his, his culture has to reassert itself sooner or later. He'll burn out. He'll get back to it. I think that's what they actually thought. To this day, I mean, people say that to me. Oh, Jeff, you'll get around. <laughs> you'll get over it sooner or later. <laughs> How many years have you been a Muslim? Twelve years? You'll get over it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but nonetheless, people still like me. They just don't invite me out to parties and things like that anymore. But the poor guy, he doesn't drink. <laughs> but the difficulties encountered with the non-Muslim community, honestly, were never what I anticipated. But entering the Muslim community, this is the part I hate to say because I don't think it's going to be popular what I'm going to say. Entering the Muslim community was very difficult. When you enter the Muslim community, you have to realize it's like entering a family in a crisis situation. It's like walking into a family argument or a family crisis where the parents are fighting with each other and the children are going cr crazy and nobody could seem to get along with each other. It's exactly what I would compare it to. No one wants to walk into a family when people are battling it out. And that's sort of the way it felt. I understood where it was all coming from. A large, large percentage of our community had suffered terrible shock. Culture shock, colonialist shock, racial oppression and discrimination, centuries of it. The humiliation of colonialism, the relegation imposed on them, by the Western world of third world status. Many of them were suffering from a terrible, deep-seated cultural inferiority, I'm sorry to say. There were deep-seated hurts and pains. And it was difficult to walk into that situation. I very quickly came to realize that every American convert, or at least I came to feel, I'm not saying this is right, but this is the way I felt. Every American convert Maybe even more so if he's white. Although the black brothers have to put up with a lot worse than I do. But especially if he's white, he becomes in a certain sense a battleground or a small piece of a very large battleground of a conflict of a war that has been going on for centuries and centuries between Occident and Orient, between colonialist and colonizer, between Muslim and Judeo-Christian. Each side has a stake in that little piece of battleground. Each side is very carefully watching it to see how things are going to turn out. Each of them is looking for cultural manifestations of this person's commitment. Each side is wanting to see which culture is going to come to dominate the others. Many a convert feels that and falls into the sort of culture trap. He finds himself taking up certain cultural practices that may not really strictly be necessary from a religious point of view. But he's vulnerable and he's weak and he's just left the community and he's, he's lost all his friends. Nobody quite reacts to them the way he's used to. He suddenly feels alone and he needs caring. He needs compassion. He needs support. And oftentimes we give in to our weaknesses and we do what's necessary to gain that support. Not consciously so much, but also unconsciously. 
That's why you'll oftentimes, I noticed that many of my friends, perhaps I fell into this pattern in a number of times, you notice that oftentimes you'll find many a young American convert, a convert of one year or six months or so, strangely enough, even though he's never left this country, even though he's been a Muslim for only six or seven months, speaking with foreign intonation patterns, sometimes even speaking with a foreign accent. I remember taking a good friend of mine from Yemen to see a lecture of another friend of mine. And my friend from Yemen said, when he was hearing him speak, he said, what part of Pakistan is he from? I said, what makes you say that? He said, I've been in Pakistan for several years, and I could recognize that accent. I think that's from northern Pakistan. I said, well, to tell you the truth, he's from San Diego. He said, <laughs> he's a sixth generation American of Scandinavian descent. But these type of things happen. You do feel a certain pressure to conform. When I became a Muslim, I got like 30 thobes within a week. Well, strictly speaking, I mean, even the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the people of the Hijaz, generally I don't think wore thobes. Hijazi dress is quite different than the modern day thobe. But somehow I felt the need to put this on to identify myself as, I'm in with you guys, please trust me. Uh, you know, stop being suspicious, don't be nervous. I'm one of you, don't worry about it, what else can I do? Some people have a very difficult time growing beards. American Indians, some Scandinavians, Chinese. I did too, I tried, believe me, I tried. I, I had more bald spot than beards, but I did my best. <laughs> I, I tried everything. I thought, if one way or another, I am going to prove myself a Muslim. If there was a behavior, no matter how extreme, I would adopt it. If there was an attitude, no matter how exclusive it is, no matter how severe, if it set me apart from anyone else, that was me. I became one of the harshest, most exclusivist, most, one of the most ju judgmental, one of the most fire and brimstone preaching Muslims you ever saw. <laughs> because they tell you the best defense is a good offense. I think that's a psychological thing. And I thought, my God, if I am going to be accepted in this community, I will prove to them that not only am I worthy of acceptance, but they're not. And so I would get up and give speeches, long, laborious, vehement speeches, about how we are not living up to the standards of the faith, how we never show up in the mosque. In fact, I was there five times a day. The subtle message was, perfunctorily, I'm saying we, when in fact I'm saying, you guys don't, but I do. <laughs> but out of, for humility's sake, to project a humble image, I would say we. We do not fast Ramadan. We do not fast, you know, on the side. Of course, everyone knew I was. We're, we don't grow beards. Well, I was growing something there. <laughs> We're ashamed to dress like Muslims. But there I was. You know, I was one of the most aggressive speakers I've ever seen. And that was probably my first mistake getting into giving speeches. And now you brothers know why and sisters know I'm so reluctant to give speeches today. Because speech making is one of the most dangerous things you could do, especially to somebody who's new in the faith. When you stand in front of an audience like this, the challenges to sincerity, the challenges to telling what you feel is the truth, when you feel all this pressure to make your opinion conform to the masses in front of you, that type of challenge of sincerity is so great that you find yourself compromising yourself time and time again, unless you could be very careful. Unless for months you build up the strength to get up there and hopefully represent, and you never really know. There's times I get off the stage and say, was I honest today? It's very difficult. But the worst thing is, I fell into the speech-making trap very early on. People saw me and they looked at me and they said, my God, this guy has blonde hair, blue eyes, six feet tall. This guy is perfect. People used to come up to me. You know, with your blonde hair and blue eyes, if I took you to my country and you gave a speech, people would start crying, etc., etc. The first time this happened was I was at a meeting much like this one. And I was sitting in the audience, much like you are. This will only take about 15 more minutes. I know you're all tired. <laughs> 
I was sitting in an audience much like this one. Suddenly I realized that the speaker was mentioning my name and I heard it over the loudspeaker. Suddenly I was alert and listening to what he was saying. He was obviously inviting me to come up on stage and tell my story. I had only been a Muslim for a couple of months. As, I, as he was saying, and Dr. Lang, would you please come up now? I was standing there shaking my head going, no, please, please. The reason I didn't want to get up there is because I knew that I didn't belong there. I knew that I was still struggling against many a difficult vice that I had acquired over those 28 years of being a non-Muslim. I knew that I, by far, had not perfected myself yet to any degree. And that I really was ashamed of myself and truly, at that moment, extremely humbled. I didn't want to get on that stage. I wasn't any hero. I was somebody desperate who took a leap who did that, who converted out of desperation. And I certainly wasn't very brave about it at all. But in any case, I got up. And I told just about the same story I just told you, that I began this speech. And the reaction was amazing. I looked at that audience, and I never saw so, much, so many tears dripping down people's faces ever before in my life. I gave a lot of math lectures, but I never got that reaction. <laughs> As I stepped down from the audience, I was surrounded by all these faces and tears and embraces. I was getting exhausted. I was being pulled from one person to the next, hugged the triple, the triple hug routine, kissed on my face, tears dripping on my face. I never saw anything like it before in my life. I was just trying to get to my car. It took me 45 minutes to get through the hall to get to my car. I was still dragging brothers with me into the car as I got in the car and drove away. <laughs> But that was the worst thing for me. Because when I went to give that speech on the stage, when I walked up to that stage and delivered that speech, at least I was in a stage of sincerity, of honesty, of humility. But when I got off that stage and saw that reaction, I felt loved. I felt important. I felt like I was going to be the next Mahdi or something. I, I, you know, there's a saying about Every hundred years there comes a reformer. I thought, well, it's 1402 in the Islamic calendar. <laughs> it's amazing what something like that could do to you. Suddenly you go from serving God to serving yourself. So easy f and when you're in that state of vulnerability, when you're in that state of loneliness, when you're in that state of isolation, to slip into those feelings. I needed that. And I would do anything to keep it. And so I became a speaker like you've never seen before. And combined with my own insecurities and paranoia, like I said, I gave very, uh, very violent, difficult speeches. You know, there's lots of infighting in the Muslim community. In my particular community, there was a real battle between the Tabliki Jamaat, the Salafis, the, Mus the MSA, Muslim Brotherhood, etc. They were really warring it out with each other at those days. And I found little by little I was being dragged from one group to the next. And as I did, I became a spokesman for that group. Here I was, a Muslim convert of only several months. And when I was at the Tabliki Jama, I was, I was exclaiming and proclaiming that there's only one way, meaning this way, of course, the group I had joined, to the exclusion of all others. Notice how I became very exclusivist. You push people away and elevate yourself. Whether you do it consciously or subconsciously, you find yourself falling into the trap. Then I went with the Salafi group for a while. I got burned out on the Tabliki Jama'ah. I couldn't keep with them. <laughs> they, they, really, they really go at it. And I became exhausted. I remember once, on one Saturday, I just couldn't take it anymore. I was so burnt out that I, I asked the brothers to give me a ride down to the bus station. They said no, so I, I just picked up my things. I walked down myself five miles, got to the bus station, and went back to San Francisco. And I'm not putting down the brothers, by the way. I'm not criticizing the organizations. I'm just letting you know what my mindset was. They probably do very good things, but I wasn't doing very good things to myself. Next thing I know, I found myself with the Salafi brothers, and I'm not criticizing this organization. 
And I certainly don't want to get involved in the Shia Sunni controversy. I don't even want to discuss it. But this was a big issue back in those days. The Iran-Iraq war was really going. Lots of people were dying on both sides. Heavy propaganda being put out by both sides. I fell into sort of the propaganda put out by one side. And I began reading it and then giving speeches about it in the message. And I had a very excited audience listening to me. And they gave me a lot of support. My, my speeches would become so enraged. And I would get so excited. I remember saying once that, I forget exactly how I put it, but I put something like that the greatest danger to Islam today and at any time in its history is Shiism. And I said right after that, it is a, what did I call it, a virulent parasite in the body of the Muslim community. Well, those are pretty strong words. And as I walked down, stepped down, and I was walking out of the masjid that night, a brother from Iraq stopped me. And he said to me, a brother, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, certainly, please, go ahead. I knew this was a Sunni audience. He said, I'm a Sunni Muslim, and I grew up in Iraq, but my whole family are Shia. And most of the things you said are just not true. I never heard any of those before. You see... What I read and what I was repeating and reciting, I knew was propaganda. I mean, I have been around universities my whole life. I know when something is written critically and analytically and a scholar is tri striving after objectivism. And I know when somebody is just selling you a bag of goods. And I knew from my experience that what the information I was relying on was not really careful scholarship. It was very weak scholarship. When I went back and researched the matter more carefully, I found out that a lot of things I was saying were exaggerations, were things taken out of context. A lot of the things I was spouting out were half-truths. A lot of th those things I was saying and declaiming were true at one time with particular Muslim sects, but those sects no longer existed. I don't want to get involved in the controversy. I certainly don't want to discuss the differences of point of view. But I'm trying to help you understand that what I was doing was very self-destructive. Because I was knowingly, I was knowingly and willingly closing my eye to truth. I came to Islam by critical study, by weighing and comparison, comparing reading what Muslims had to write about Islam, reading what non-Muslims had to write about Islam, reading what Muslim scholars had to write about it and Orientalists had to write about it. And by comparing the arguments back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and by analyzing them and studying the Quran very closely and critically, I became a Muslim. And now at this stage of my life, I was tossing all that behind and becoming a fire and brimstone, ranting and raving, Muslim version of Elmer Gantry, if you knew what I, who I'm talking about. And I was purposely allowing myself to not be more critical in my approach. Because I wanted to be loved. You know that verse in the Quran? The first one that talks about Satan, the originator of sin. What is his flaw? Pride. And it was pride and weakness and insecurity, self-centeredness, that was allowing me to do that. I decided never to attack another group of Muslims again. I would still give speeches in the mosque and lectures about how nobody lives up to the demands of faith, except me, of course. <laughs> I continued to give those. But now I, I directed my attack towards Christians, Christians and Jews. My first wife was Jewish. I knew that a lot of things about Jews that people say are not true. But I became one of the greatest Jewish haters in America. Against Christians, I used all the famous arguments that we use against fundamentalist Christians. You know, the arguments you see on tapes and things. I'm not complaining about the arguments. But brothers and sisters, I knew better. I've studied Christianity. 
I know what modern Christian scholars think. And the arguments that we often use are arguments that were first developed by very critical, very good Muslim scholars. They gave very elaborate arguments for their positions. Of whom am I speaking? Ibn Hazm, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Rushd. The arguments that we use today, most of us are using and repeating when we argue with fundamentalist Christians, are arguments that were developed many centuries ago. And what we are usually often using are boiled down, digested versions of them that are nowhere as good as the versions produced by those scholars. But more importantly, Christian thought has changed a lot in the last several centuries. Christian scholars no longer think the way Christian scholars did seven centuries ago. The arguments that Ibn Hazm used against Christian scholars no longer apply because Christian scholars have evolved, they've changed their opinions over the years. It might work against an ignorant Christian, someone who doesn't know anything about modern Christian doctrine. But the arguments will not work against a legitimate Christian scholar. You've, you've probably seen it many times when you see a Muslim speaker get against a real Christian scholar, not Jimmy Swagger, because he's not a scholar, or one of these guys from the Zwemer Institute, a real Christian scholar. The argument seems to go nowhere. They're not communicating with each other. The Muslims always say to me, is he purposely dodging the arguments? No, because the arguments are not, are, have nothing to do with what he now feels. His positions are different. So we either have to update our knowledge and learn those, or else, when we do give some discussions to, most, to, to general audiences, we should mention that this is not the opinion of all Christians. There are many other opinions, and we should at least allow the audience to know what the varied opinions are. To be honest, but I wasn't doing that. I was only letting them know a piece of the picture. It's only that I knew the audience were probably unknowledgeable Christians. And I was using arguments that I knew would work against them. Because they knew nothing of Christianity. And they knew nothing of Christian scholarship. And it worked. They were impressed. But I knew that I wasn't being wholly honest. But the Muslim audience was ready to carry me out on their shoulders. They took me as some sort of hero. The Christian audience was completely shocked and afraid of me. <clears throat> but then I sort of experienced a turnaround, for better or for worse. I don't know how you feel about it. And what made me sort of back off? And remember, by now I was a real extremist. I mean, I was extreme as they come. <clears throat> well, are you exhausted? What made me back off? Well, the first thing is, is that even though I was becoming more and more extreme, even though my practices were the hardest and the harshest of almost any member in our community, even though I could outpray, outfast, outperform almost any brother there was, I was feeling terribly empty inside. My prayers, I didn't feel hardly anything anymore. I felt like I was distant from God. I felt lost. I felt lonely from God. I remember the days when I first converted, when I was nobody, when I was nothing, when I had no good practice, when I was still had many, many wrongs that I had to correct. I remember those days that I made the shahada, just took that shahada, even though I know that I had to struggle against so much inside myself. I remember how beautiful and how sweet and how powerful those prayers were. I recalled that wonderful, beautiful, fantastic, divine embrace, that feeling like you're in the presence of this tremendous love. I remembered that, and I missed it terribly. No matter how good I felt I was becoming, I wasn't feeling anything anymore, like when I was bad, but struggling. And then second, Grant helped straighten me out in a very strange way. Grant converted sort of a month after I converted, a few weeks after I converted. He was also a 
American Muslim of Irish descent. He and I, we were just like two peas in a pod. Our ways of thinking, everything were identical. It was so great. He was the first American Muslim I saw ever. I mean, of course, it was only a month, but I wouldn't see another one for another six months. He seemed like the only other American Muslim of European descent in the world. And we got along great. It's something about somebody from your own culture. Sometimes you could share an idea just by a glance. Well, it might take you an hour to explain it to somebody else who's not from your background. This is how close we were. We ate dinner together. We did everything together. We analyzed each other together. We helped criticize each other in a positive sense, our growth and development in the religion. He was, for me, a true brother. I helped him, and he helped him. And I, I helped him, and he helped me. In any case, I got married. And I sort of, you know how it is when you first get married, you're very busy. I lost tra contact with Grant for a while. And then one day I invited him over for dinner. And there we were, sitting there. I was, we, I was now Muslim for almost three years. And I said, so Grant, how have you been? I mean, I haven't seen you for several months. He said to me, Jeff, I left the religion. I was in shock. What was he trying to do to me, I thought. What do you mean you left the religion? It's just not working out. He said, actually, this is the second time I left a religion. First time, I just got burnt out. I left it for a few months. This time, I've converted to Buddhism. And I was just so hurt. I hardly even heard any of his explanation. But that moment caused me to search deep inside myself. I had to determine why I was a Muslim. I had to retrace my footsteps. I had to go back and remember why I committed myself to this religion. I had to do a tremendous amount of soul searching and find myself again. Grant helped me in one final way. He came to a speech, my, a speech I gave to a Christian audience a few months later. It was the usual fire and brimstone, Christians, you're, you're not worthy speech. It was the usual humiliate the Christian speech. After the speech, I met Grant. Grant was in the audience, I was to my surprise. I said, uh, Grant and I went out for coffee. Grant, how did it go? And when I asked Grant that, I wasn't looking for, uh, for praise. When Grant knew when I asked him that question, he knew that it, I really wanted his sincere response. That's the kind of relationship we had. He said, Jeff, that audience of Muslims, they don't want to hear what you have to say. They want to hear what they have to say. They just want you to say it. And that's what you're doing. And you're sounding irrational. And it was the best thing he could have ever done for me. Because it made me realize that I was not on the right track. So these three things made me decide I've got to start from scratch. I've got to get away from the pressure. I've got to get away from all the groups. I've got to get away from all the infighting. I've got to stop trying to be what I'm not. I have to go back and be what I am to define myself again and find that light that brought me back to Islam and that love and power and that greatness that, is, that Islam could bring out in a person rather than what my ego could bring out in me. So what did I do? I decided to stay away from the mosque. For seven months I didn't go to the mosque except for Friday prayers. I went for Friday prayers I just kept up with my worship, but I did a lot of soul searching, a lot of reading, a lot of study, a lot of long walks, even 10 miles some days. And I really thought very deeply about my progress or lack of it in the religion. <clears throat> the brothers, of course, and sisters were nervous. They would call my wife, what's happening to your husband? Right? Is he relieving the religion? The brothers too were extremely nervous. Where is he going? What's the matter with Jeff? What's the matter with Dr. Jeffrey? You know, I knew that was going to be their reaction. But I had to find myself. And so I took that seven-month vacation. After about seven months, I noticed one Friday in a Friday prayer that there was a new brother in the mosque. His name was Matthew. <clears throat> he certainly quickly took the name Khalid shortly after that. <clears throat> 
Uh, we really hit it off right from the start. He was younger than me, but he was new to the religion. And he always had questions he was asking me again and again and again. It got me involved again in the community. I started coming more often, mostly to be of help. See, I have a younger brother made Ma named Matthew. He's six years younger than me. This Matthew was also six years younger than me. A lot like my younger brother. And he had a personality just like him. I just instantly loved this guy. And so I stayed, just like with my younger brother, I stayed very close to him. I didn't want to tell him where to go or what to do or what direction to go in. I thought every person has to learn that for themselves. But I did try to at least warn him about potential dangers along the way. I've seen people go to the extreme end of things and do it very successfully and seem to be very happy. It didn't work for me. It might work for Matthew. I don't know. But at least if I felt that he might be slipping or hurting, I wanted to be there to help him. So I came to the mas masjid quite often those days. And Ma Matthew and I became very, very close. And he had a wife, I had a wife. He had two children, I had two at the time. We were a perfect match. So we were always together, picnics, everything. It was working out great. Matthew converted to Islam. Then his daughter did. His son, Alec, I won't mention his name, his son also did, but he was only a couple of months old. But, you know, he considered him converted to Islam. His wife needed some work. I volunteered to help, explain things to her at least, but not push her. Several months later, she converted to Islam, an entire family of converts. <clears throat> and we were extremely close. Well, it was now about four years into my conversion. And I was feeling sort of smothered by the community. And I needed to get away. I can't explain it, brothers, but I just felt that I just couldn't stay in that community anymore. They were good brothers, but they had known me from the start, and I was just not feeling good about it anymore. So I decided to move away from San Francisco. I looked for jobs. I got a job at Lawrence, Kansas, at the University of Kansas. I decided to jump at it. I took it. It also meant a slight increase in pay. But frankly, my biggest reason for leaving was I needed to get away from that, my first Muslim community. Sad to say. And so I left. But before I left, I would see Matthew quite often. Like I said, Matthew took the name Khaled. And then he named all the members in his family with Arabic names. I told him, Matthew, please, I mean, you don't have to go that far. He said, no, I'm gonna, we're going to change our names legally, all of us. I said, yeah, I know, but you have a child six years old. You know, children are kind of confused about their identity. And, you know, this could be a, beard, a burden greater than she could bear. Maybe I should take it easy about that. He said, no, nope, I'm going to do it, and that's it. I could already see Matthew was becoming extremely tough. I admired him for it, but I was also worried about him. He was extremely zealous. I told him, look, you have a perfectly beautiful name. Matthew means a gift from God. Khaled it's also a wonderful name. It's one of the great Muslim generals and leaders, one of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. But there's nothing wrong with the name Matthew. It's a beautiful name. It means a gift from God. Your daughter's name is a beautiful name. It's not offensive to the idea of the oneness of God. Salman al-Farsi never changed his name to an Arabic name. Neither did Bilal. Why are you doing this? He said, well, and then he gave reasons. And they were good reasons. I want the people in the community to be at ease with me, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I said, okay, fine, but give your daughter. Let her make that decision herself. No, I'm going to do it. And he did. <clears throat> Later on, I found out at another dinner, he got his wife and his daughter, six-year-old daughter, to cover their hair. And she did, out of respect for her parents. And she went to school that way. I remember that dinner very well, because there was another couple there. And the fellow asked his six-year-old daughter, what's your name, sweetie? Or what's your name, honey? She just froze there. She didn't know how to answer. He asked again, the mom and dad sitting there, her mom and dad sitting there looking at her sternly, what's your name, honey? She was very uneasy. Please, what's your name? Can't you tell me your name? She looks up very nervously. Aisha? <laughs> she had a very difficult time pronouncing it. The parents nodded their approval. <clears throat> well, she had a difficult time at school. They took her out of school for a while and put her in a Muslim school. I don't know what didn't work out there. There was a lot of fighting, a lot of conflict in the community. It wasn't working out. They put her back in public school again. 
still making, having her cover her hair. She received a lot of abuse from the children. It was a very difficult time for her. Finally, when we left San, uh, San Francisco, I had dinner, one last dinner at Matthew's, uh, Khaled's house. <laughs> and when, I, when we went over, I noticed that this time we were segregated. Well, he had several families over, but the men were all sitting in one room and the women in another. Now, I told him, Matt, a Khalid, and that's the way I usually did things. Matt, Khalid, because Matt is such a close personal name for me. Matt, Khalid, uh, why are you doing this? I mean, is it really necessary? He said, what do you mean? It's demanded by the religion. I said, I said I, I'm not trying to sway you, but it might not be, I said. I mean, for example, I mean, in Imam Malik's Mawatta, in the section about etiquettes of dining, Imam Malik writes that, and I'm not trying to argue with your brother's a case, I just want you to understand my mindset at the time. I said, Imam Malik writes that there's no problem if males and females, a woman eats in the presence of men, as long as a male relative is present. And he gives examples, like an uncle or a brother or something like that. And then he says, this is the sunnah of the people of Medina. In those days, they didn't make, differentiate so much. The sunnah didn't exclusively mean the sunnah of the prophet in the early law books, peace be upon him. It could also mean the, pra the local practice of the community. But in the second century, Imam Malik, I told him, was writing that this is not what we do in Medina. 200 years into the history of Islam. And I quoted for him hadith where men and women seem to be present in the same room. He said, yes, but there are also hadith where they're not. I said, I know, it seemed to be an anarchic practice. Some, some people did it, some people didn't. Didn't seem to be a big issue. You know, it didn't seem to be written down that everyone had to. Some, some of the companions did, some of them didn't. So what? In your case, why, why are you adopting the hardest line? Like I said, I'm not, I don't want to get embroiled in an argument about this after. I'm just presenting my argument to Matt. <laughs> Sorry, I, don't, I really don't want to deal with it. But in any case, Matthew, I'm not reading. Ma Matthew, he continued on. I left San Francisco. Hammett says I have to get done in five minutes. He doesn't like this line of, <laughs> line of talk. But in any case, when I arrived in Lawrence, Kansas, I wanted to keep contact with the brothers back in... San Francisco. It's natural. <laughs> You're new to a town. So I kept contact with him by phone. Grant I tried like crazy to get in touch with. But Grant, I realized, was being kicked out of his house. He had lost his job. He felt he was going to end up a street person. I don't know if he ever did or not, but nobody ever saw him again. And he was one of the closest friends I've ever had. And then we spoke to Matthew, uh, Khalid, we spoke to him and his wife, and it turns out their daughter became very ill. She lost a very lot of weight. She had to be hospitalized, an eating disorder. And that was the first great shock to their family. Shortly after that, we heard a couple months later that Matthew had resigned from the leadership of the masjid. He was the leader for a while. Several months later, we heard that he had completely left the Muslim community. His wife told us. Long after, in that conversation, she didn't know how long she was going to hang out. Hang in there. Finally, we heard a few months after that, we couldn't get in touch with them. They had their number enlisted and they moved. But the last anybody in the community remembers, and they were pretty unanimous on this, is that the whole family had uh, renounced Islam. <clears throat> well, needless to say, that was some of the most depressing news I ever heard. And I guess I just felt tremendous pain and hurt. Not because two people left Islam. Believe me, brothers and sisters, I saw many, many people come and almost as many leave. I've seen lots of converts and I've seen lots of people go back. More than, more than not. It's just that these two were such close personal friends. We had grown in this religion together. We, we were just extremely close. I felt such hurt, such pain, such anger, and I didn't even know who to direct it to. At first, I felt anger towards the community. But then I thought, my goodness, they're going through their own crises. They're going through their own problems. They're going through their own crisis experience. Why should I blame them? And then I felt angry at people like me and Matthew and, or Khaled and Grant. His, his Muslim name was Salahuddin for a while. Because we go to such extremes. 
as Grant did. For several months, he was worse than I was. And we put ourselves under such pressure, and then we can't take it, and we burn out. But then I thought, what's the use of being angry at anybody? There's no blame you could give anybody. So I just felt hurt. I felt hurt at the loss of Grant, and I felt hurt at the loss of my brother Matthew, who for me, at one time, really was a gift from God, at a stage when I really needed one. And so I want to end this by just sharing with you a few thoughts I wrote down right around that time. And the night that I was extremely depressed, I just wrote a couple of lines in my diary about a good friend of mine and our experiences together. And I wrote it very briefly. It takes three minutes, Hammond. It's a page and a half. And I'll share it with you. It's, it's somewhat incoherent. You have to remember this is sort of like what you would expect in a diary. And, uh, yes. And, and I'll end with this. He hates to have me read from my notes. But I'm a writer. And once you write something, you can never say it is good again. So this is just about Grant, and I'll end with this. Grant lived on the outskirts of the Mission District in San Francisco, one of the poorest sectors of the city, where he rented the bottom floor of a small aging two-story house. It had been his home for over a decade, and thanks to rent control, it was too good a bargain to let go of, even if the neighborhood was steadily deteriorating, and it was. A block from his flat and from the turnpike was the San Francisco Islamic Center, which in more prosperous times probably was a warehouse, and which could still be easily mistaken for one, unless one happened to see the small marker above the side entrance. Grant walked past that center almost every day on his way to the bus stop, so he knew what it was and why Middle Eastern and Indo-Pakistani costume men frequented there. His fascination with religions led him to the, his first, first visit to the center, which would inevitably lead to his conversion, for Grant would never be fully satisfied with a religion until he immersed himself in it. He wanted to experience it through and through. His fascination, oh, I said that. He proceeded, as always, cautiously, requiring several visits before he made his shahada. It's better to take your time before deciding, they warned him, because the penalty for leaving Islam is death. Grant ignored the death threat. I met Grant a week after his conversion, which was about three weeks after mine. And at that time, he was only the second white American Muslim I had ever seen. Six months later, he quit Islam for a short time, then returned to it. A year after that, he left it again to join the Sikhs for a short stint. Then he became a Buddhist. Before Islam, he had tried several other religions, Catholicism, Russian Orthodoxy, Judaism, among them. But tonight, he was in limbo again, neither here nor there. He had no religion at that time. He told me, I change religions more often than I change my socks. But for Grant, it was hardly a joke. It was one failure after another to quench his love for God, to find a community of faith where that love could be known and lived. Islam has the best religion, he said, but the worst believers. He was quoting a well-known Muslim writer. I didn't completely agree, but I never had much hope in humanity anyway. Yet for Grant, the religious community was at least as important as the religion's ideology. For me, the ideology was all that mattered. Through as many conversions, we remained friends, and we frequently had dinner together, before and after I got married, and our conversations almost always led to religion. Our strong friendship, together with his rejection of Islam and his general undecidedness about religions, had me always scrutinizing and questioning my own commitment, and I learned a lot about, about myself from it. Grant, for me, in a very strange, weird way, became a spiritual guide, asking questions I hadn't thought of, but I needed to, unintentionally forcing me to explore deeper and deeper into myself through his conversations. He was almost like a spiritual hitter, my blue-eyed, sharp and witty Irish green pilot into so many contradictions. What was it going to be like without him, I thought, as I veered towards the exit that would take us to his house. I was dropping him off at his house. I was leaving San Francisco. This would be the last time I would see him. Grant said, it's awfully hard to serve God, Jeff, to truly serve him. My first impulse was to agree with him, but the line between serving God and ourselves is so infinitesimally thin, as I had come to learn. Maybe we're more demanding than God is, Grant. Maybe God only wants us to keep trying. I do love God, Jeff, he told me. 
I knew Grant was trying to explain. Explained to me finally on our last time we'd ever see each other why he left the religion. He knew it hurt me deeply, and he was trying to address that hurt. But by now I had gotten over it. I told him, Grant, there's no need to explain. I know you tried. I know you searched hard. Passing the Islamic Center on our left, we made a right onto Ogden Street. I stopped the car in front of Grant's apartment, turning the tires into the curb. Some people could express themselves so effortlessly. They could capture, order, analyze, interpret, and relate their feelings in a single breath. I hadn't planned any parting words, and if I had, I probably would have told Grant how glad I was to have known him. How much I gained from our friendship. That I looked forward to Kansas, because a new place is a chance to grow. But that I would always remember him and miss him. The dream which I wrote about in the first chapter of this book, and which I told you about in the beginning of this lecture, long sustained me through the turmoils and certainties of conversion. I kept remembering it, I wrote it down, so that I would never forget it. In time, the dream gave way to my daily reading of the Quran, supplanted by its captivating call from heaven. Somehow the, the importance of the dream faded, and the experience of reading the Quran daily became more powerful. Both, both the dream and the reading of the Quran are still very important to me. But the experience of God's love in prayer and contemplation now far overshadow those. And yet I am ever more aware of my weaknesses and failings. And believe me, I have a ton of them. I know now that if I lose God again, then I will have surely lost it all. And I plead like the famous, famous poetess Rabia al Adawiya, Oh my God, would you really burn this heart that loves you so? And I find comfort in her answer. If you know the poem. I walked Grant over to the stairway to his apartment. Take care of yourself and keep in touch, I told him, as we shook hands. Something in a moment told me, and I think Grant too, that we would never hear from each or see each other again. Over the years, I tried calling him and writing him. I had friends in the Bay Area try to locate him, but to no avail. Assalamu alaikum, Jeff. He smiled assuringly. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. And may God's peace and mercy be upon you always. And thank you so much for bearing with me. Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> Sorry, I have to read it. That's, it's a long time ago. May Allah bless you for this story. I think uh, the purpose of uh, giving this story is to learn from it. Uh, I think he talked to us as an outside insider. So talking from the inside and at the same time from the outside. So this gives us a chance to learn about the difficulties, the journey, and inshallah it will help us take some lessons in making da'wah inshallah. No, you might be sleepy, so let me maybe tell you a joke in the Egyptian way. Always uh, give jokes at this time. Uh, one time, uh, the... Huh? No, I'm sure people love this time. So. You're from Egypt, aren't you? Uh, they... Uh, caught somebody from al Ikhwan Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood, they put him in jail and uh, he was telling me some of the funny stories that he had and among them uh, they uh, uh, gave him meat, it's too, you know, too old, it cooks for too long and he was telling me uh, they used to tell them we only respect this meat because if it's too old. So, <laughs> uh, they caught somebody with uh, the jail, and then they take him. Uh, they took him out of jail. They found out that he was a Christian. So they they hate him strongly, and they said, "A Christian and joining them too, you deserve more." <laughs> uh, we, inshallah, we will take some questions. I know it's too late, but uh, will not take too long, inshallah. Somebody wants to. Uh, Speak, please come to the mic. Brother uh, Shakir, you wanted to talk, so come in. Brother Jeffrey doesn't like uh, arguments too much, so he, most of the things he presented, presented as part 
of the history that he had in his life. So we don't want to go into elaborate fiqh discussion or anything of that sort. Yes. Yeah. Give me that one. Please go ahead. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Um, out of the times, um, I mean the hard times you've been through, you, uh, you mentioned your friends who converted to uh, from Islam. Like, what thing that st uh, kept you from converting the most? What thing that stick to you the most to the Islam? Thing? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, uh, no. Yeah. I, mean, I don't mean that. Like, but just um, I want to know the thing that give you the feeling that I should stay. I shouldn't convert. I have to think about it. You do. Uh, <clears throat> see, my uh, experience of conversion was different than the others, the other two. Not better or worse, it just was different. Um, when I thought, the question was, why didn't I leave? Believe me, uh, brother, there were times when I thought about it. There were, there were times when I definitely contemplated just going away, hiding somewhere, leaving this community, moving to try to get a job at Purdue University, get away. And just wherever I go, not tell anybody that I was ever a Muslim. I mean, there were times when I just wanted to be just Jeff Lang again, where, where everybody would just relate to me like they did in the old days, when everything would be familiar, when I would be everybody's best boy, you know, guy. The old, you know, my professors used to say, Jeff, you're such a red-blooded American boy, the typical American. I wanted to be that again sometimes. I really missed that camaraderie, that, that friendliness. There was always this barrier now. And also, the Muslim community, I was having a very difficult time fitting in. So there were many times, as I mentioned in the speech, there were many times I definitely contemplated leaving. I got to admit it. And I thought about it long and hard, before and after I was married. But see, I mean, as I mentioned in the first lecture today, and I don't say this to get, you know, this is not to gain credit or anything, it's just an explanation. I converted to Islam and I thought about it. I converted to Islam on, the, on my reading of the Quran. And it was that experience of reading the Quran and coming to know God and experiencing His mercy and compassion and love and kindness through that experience. That's what made me a Muslim. When I got through, I knew better than I knew my own self. I mean, this is a subjective statement. I'm not pretending this is a scientific statement. But I knew better than I knew my own self that the Quran was a revelation of God, that there was a God and this was his revelation. I knew it as, as firmly as I could walk with my feet on the ground. So the long and the short of what I'm saying is I could run from a community I could even run from myself, but I couldn't run from God. You know, I, I knew it. I, I knew there was really nowhere to go. I knew I had to stay. Because, like I said before, if I lose that, I lose it all. You know, so I, I couldn't leave. You know, even no matter how strong was the inclination, I had to stay. And believe me, the inclination was strong. I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but it was strong. But when push came to shove, I knew there was nowhere to go. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dr. Jeff, or Jeff, Matthew, or Khalid. Uh, I have heard. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to hear you, to hear you speak without being asked, and to speak your heart as you've done. I enjoyed your presentation uh, during the day. I, I, I enjoyed this one even much more. And I would like to just, if I may, I'm not going to ask you a question, so don't be scared. <laughs> And it's not going to be a fiqh issue that I'm going to address. So don't worry about it. I'm really impressed uh, with 
the whole struggle that you've gone through, what I really want to share with you and everybody here is that this is, and I'm sure you know that, this is what life is all about. The pain you're through, the pain you've gone through, the pain that you will go through is what life is all about. And the simple verse that has summarized all of that is just in Surah Al-Balad. Ya ayyuhal insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan famulaqi. Uh, Al-Inshaqaq, I'm sorry. Uh, o oh man, you are just struggling. Painful struggle. And you will find it when you meet your Lord. So, just hang in there. And life is not longer than what has gone by. And uh, inshallah, we hope we'll meet you in paradise. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. I would like to say one thing. What you said, is not only what you said is not the only one experience I'm a Muslim from Egypt I came 1979 with exactly what I'm wearing I went to Catholic University of America to continue my uh, master degree all what you said I experience not because of my Muslim because of my look also American did not accept me I have to struggle or I struggled and I win the case I'm graduate and they respect me the way I am so I want you to know is not because you convert your fighting or your suffering. I think most of us. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, we're all sort of in the same boat. Different, different, we just walked in through different doors, so to speak. You know, I, I think that, yes, <laughs> different, yes, from different oceans. Uh, I, yeah, I think that every human being, like it says in the, Quran, you know, do you think you could have entered paradise without having gone through what those have gone through before you? You know, you got to, you got to expect that it's going to be difficult. And the, the part I was trying to make is the biggest challenges sometimes come from where you don't expect them. You know, the biggest challenges usually are challenges to sincerity, to honesty. Those are the most difficult ones. You know, pride, self-centeredness, ego. That's, that's what I was trying to... You know, that's the first thing I always tell my new Muslim friends that have recently converted. You know, I try to warn them. That's going to be the, I think, the most difficult part. And I would have appreciated if somebody told me that when I converted. It would have helped. You know, if somebody said, watch out for this. You know, these are the sort of traps that are there for you. Try to be careful. Yeah. Especially in a community which, uh, like ours that has so many conflicts, so many tensions, so many pains. Go ahead, please. I must admit uh, that I have been really moved with your speech and your the eloquent words that you have been used to express the way that you came to Islam and what have you. However, we must know the fact that uh, you have came to Islam not because yourself but because Allah wanted you to be Muslim and this is as you believe in the Quran إِنَّمَا اللَّهُ يَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْ اَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءْ Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala قَالَ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءْ and at the same time there is no uh, compulsion in Islam. You can be Muslim and you cannot be Muslim. And at the same time, Islam has no impact or significance as to individual. Even the Prophet himself, alayhi salatu wasalam, he came and died. But Islam is still alive and since the time of Adam and the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And at the same time, your speech remind me of other prominent, famous individual who converted to Islam. And it just really remind me of uh, brother Yusuf Islam, Cat Stephen, the famous uh, rock music who uh, shook the ground under those 
who were in love with the rock music. He came and the media here in Washington DC, they asked him the question, why did you become Muslim and how you became a Muslim? And he answered, he said, this question has been asked to me hundreds and hundreds of times. But the simple answer is that I search and I search everywhere. I could not find one religion can satisfy me as much as I found it in Islam, which is I found it 50% convinced me that I could not find any percentage in any other religion. This man, he, you can, I don't know if you've seen him or not, but you can see the faith and the deep Iman in his behavior and his characteristic and he gave up all his fame. He went through what you have been through. He went to South Africa and he declared Islam there. He stayed one month in the community of, 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 of South African. Just one second. They always have one month every year. Everybody leaves his own business to get together and discuss Islam together. And during that time, he became Muslim. What I'm saying is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hopefully will give you the, the, the power and the strength to use that for your own uh, benefit <laughs> because by being Muslim, it's, uh, it's a blessing to your own self. And uh, the final question is, what's your advice to those brothers who have been converted to Islam, who are, uh, I should say, white Anglo-Saxon American, that sometimes one of them express the same feeling of being lonely. What's your advice to them, and what's your advice to the Islamic community, how can they help them to overcome these obstacles? Let me just put it for you. Well, I, I think the advice would be more or less the same to white or, or black or Hispanic or whatever. I think uh, basically what happens is when a person converts to Islam, those nearest to him, he in some sense feels that there's suddenly a barrier. So I think that loneliness that feeling of isolation, that feeling of unfamiliarity is there for all of Americans when they convert to Islam. I, I think so. My advice really is to all converts to Islam, if I could give it, although I, I've gotten much better advice than I give, but uh, my advice really is to not adopt any, and this is just simple, not to adopt any position or behavior or attitude towards others unless you are absolutely certain that you must. See, what we have a tendency to do is we take on certain behaviors, attitudes, positions without really being, sh just sort of we take them on just to sort of prove ourselves. Then you get in a difficult situation where then you realize you might have been wrong or you feel that you're burning out and then you have to try to figure out some way out of this corner you painted yourself into. And then you start to create a situation much worse than you originally were trying to avoid. Now everybody doubts you. What is he? What is he? He's changing. He's going crazy. He's leaving the religion, etc. You know? And so you just deepen your problem. Also in terms of integrity and sincerity. Try to be sure of yourself before you take on a behavior, insi start insisting on things. Before you start making personal judgments, try to be very sure of your information. Try to not just, you know, jump into something without giving it really deep. And if you have just a wrinkle of doubt, don't take a position. You know, give yourself time. You, know, you, you end up you know, creating fewer barriers for yourself. You know, I really, honestly, the best advice I could give to the Muslim community when it comes to converts 
kind of leaves him alone. Uh, don't try to impose a particular way of thought on them. You know, when I became a Muslim, they, these were grabbed, one guy would grab me over here and say, uh, you know, why don't you come over to my house for dinner tonight? I have to talk to you. And I'd get there and he would be trying for several hours to get me to understand Islam his way. I would go to the masjid the next day, another brother would say, come, you have to come over to my house for dinner. And he knew what the other brother probably was saying and he wanted to correct me so that I would understand it his way. And I found myself being dragged from here to here to here. It's very bad. Also, don't put the person on stage. Speeches could kill a person. You could destroy a person's sincerity in an in a instant. That's why I keep telling Brother Hamid, Brother Hamid, I don't want to speak anymore. <laughs> You know, honestly, but uh, sometimes I do. But, you know, it's really difficult. I think we, I would kindly ask you, we want to conclude, so. Yes, uh, please. <coughs> uh, these two questions came from the sisters, and uh, no, I wanted to conclude, but I'll give you the option of answering one of them. Uh, we uh, found this uh, watch, it belongs to any brother or sister. I think it was found the brother's restroom, so it should be for the brother. Uh, oh, this is a very good question. You please come and uh, pick it up. You know one thing you did uh, good today? You what? didn't talk about Lawrence, Kansas. He's <laughs> <laughs> my own town. <laughs> Purdue is very nice. It's my alma mater. He's going to read it. <laughs> oh, I love Purdue. Uh, yeah, the boiler makers. <laughs> Let me see. This uh, this note says many African American uh, many African Americans are influenced uh, and become Muslims through nationalism. What do you believe will be a formidable influence to lead Euro Americans to Islam here in America? They can't all stumble into it by accident. This is true. Can you explain the question? Well, the question is, is that many uh, African-American Muslims, if I understand this correctly, have been one of the motivations that gets African-American people in America interested in Islam is, there's a number of issues, but it seems to indicate that, and I hope you, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, so, sort of searching for a cultural uh, identity, background, number one. Number two, it's also very much a movement in the black American community, in the uh, Islam. And so many African Americans see that as a real viable movement and option, uh, more or less. If I right or wrong, I'm not a black, Afri I'm not an African American, so it's difficult for me to, to be quite accurate about it. But it's something to that effect there's strong motivation within that community to consider Islam right, as an alternative way of life. <coughs> and it's a strong alternative. And there's a considerable community. But in the, you'll notice that um, there are very few European American Muslims. And most have enter leave. <laughs> um, what would be some way what would be a formidable influence, similar to the one I just mentioned for the African American community, what would be a formidable influence on American Muslims, I mean Americans, to get them to think about Islam as a, as a you know, to really consider it seriously? That's a difficult question. I haven't really thought about it carefully, but I do know that, and it's an extremely important question. You have to understand, to some extent, the white American mentality. I think that the average European American sees himself as this is his culture. It's a prejudicial position, but he sees this as his. America was founded by his forefathers. They may have had to practically wipe out the American Indian population to do it, but he sees it as his structure. He sees it as a superior structure. He sees it as an intellectual leader. He sees that the European American is superior in his mind. So it's very hard to get him or her to take a close look at Islam. Because he, he or she has already put it in their mind that we are, 
You're patently superior. What do I need another system for? We're leading the world. Why do I have to consider Islam? Look at these dictatorships in Muslim lands. We have freedom here. Look, they're depending on our intellectual achievements to improve their countries. We're sending our scholars over there. We have great scholars. And he sees them as European American mostly, or European, strongly European American influence. So this strong feeling of superiority, it's difficult to get them to consider Islam as a, seriously. <coughs> now, there was a famous Western scholar of religion called C.G. Jung. And he once wrote something that is extremely true that the ideas of the scholars, I told this to one brother today, eventually become the ideas of the masses. If you want to convince a dominant culture of something, you have to convince their scholars, their intellectual leaders. So if you want to win, to get European-American Americans, to seriously consider this, this religion, you have to challenge them intellectually. You have to show that this religion deserves to be considered on an intellectual level. You have to show them, and that's why I gave, give speeches about questions of faith and reason, questions about Islam and philosophical problems, questions about Islam and Western objections to religion. Because I think that if we are ever to get European American culture to seriously consider this religion, or Western European culture to seriously consider the religion, or even Japanese culture to seriously consider the religion, or even most cultures, because most are now have, are very anxious to adopt Western culture. If we're going to do that, then we're going to have to make a scholarly, intellectual case for the religion. And that means producing real scholars who could relate to people in the West in ways that they could relate to, with the same critical standards, the same attempt at objectivity, the same compelling type of case, same scrutiny, criticism, etc. I know that type of scholarship is always culturally biased. That's, uh, to some extent, unavoidable. But at least the attempt is usually made. If we're going to do that, we're going to have to win this case intellectually, which means that our children, because I don't think this generation could do it very well, we have to hope our children produce that type of scholar, that they become educated, that they are both American and Muslim, and that they could take this case to the halls of learning, because that will then influence the culture. The currently political correct movement in the United States. These were ideas held by university professors for the last 50 years. It takes time. And if Muslims are going to have an effect, they're going to have to win that case there. We have to produce writers, we have to produce intellectuals, we have to produce scholars. We have to start doing this job seriously. Getting up and screaming about our religion and cheerleading is not going to take us very far. Okay, th thank you for that beautiful question. The last question is, and I'll stop with this. You don't want me to do this question? Well, you started it. So. Okay. When we give dawah to non-Muslims, how can we avoid falling into com the common trap of being defensive and sometimes even apologetic about our certain aspects of Islam? What is the ultimate purpose of dawah, in your opinion? Well, I'll just say briefly, I've never really set out to convert anyone. Because personally, from my own experience, I know that I never have converted anybody to, any, to, to Islam in my life. Because we don't convert to Islam, God guides. But our job is to deliver the perspective as sincerely, and honestly, as accurately as we can. I think we fall into problems of apologeticism. I think we fall into various traps, defensive traps, by giving ourselves too much credit. We assume that if we have the right strategy, if we address the right issue, etc., 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 we'll somehow, within our power, win this person over. But actually, I think the most, I'm sorry, I won't be able to take that question. I think the most effective thing we could do is sincerely 
and honestly express our living of the religion, our experience of the religion. Because most of us are not scholars, but we do have a, a very rich experience of faith. If we sincerely and honestly share that with others, with no punches pulled, but being respectful of the people's opinion and their mentality, I think that's the most successful. If you remember my st that story I told you about when I converted to Islam, they were talking to me about fiqh issues, they were talking to me about punishment in the grave, they were talking about, believe me, if they kept along those lines, I wouldn't be a Muslim today. What was the question that influenced me? What is your relationship to God? Suddenly all their strategizing stopped. And this guy just lowered his head and pulled out from his heart his most sincerest and deepest feelings about himself and God. That moved me. That was the catalyst. I think if you, when you could reach that level of sincerity and honesty, then you can reach people. But all these strategies, most people see them as strategies. You know, they're not fooled. People are, are not easily fooled. They know when you're trying to convert them. But if you sh just sincerely and honestly share your perceptions and your experience with no effort to try to win this person over but leaving that up to God, I think you'll, be, you'll benefit humanity much better and benefit yourself much better. I'm sorry this took so long. I thought it was an important question. I thank you so much. I'm very tired. You're very tired. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Have a good night. Yeah. Uh, let us conclude the session. Let us conclude the session, sister, and then uh, we'll, we'll... Would tomorrow be okay? Uh, we will have the Ikhama for Fajr prayer at 5.45. I'll conclude so that the people go and then you uh, will take this, inshallah. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Nashallu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. I want to bless you all and you forgive us for the delay and for keeping you so late. السلام عليكم.